Hello, uh, my name is uh, Chang Yu, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to introduce uh, the plenary speakers. Uh, there will be three uh, plenary speakers today. Uh, the first speaker uh, will be, is all the way from uh, Germany, and uh, the second speaker uh, from LG, and the third speaker from uh, Seoul National University. Um, I thought I came, uh, I came all the way from uh, Daejeon, which is about 150 kilometers south of Korea, and I thought I made a long trip. But uh, our next speaker came all the way from Germany, so he came really, really far, so I have to thank him. Um, he is a professor in the uh, computer science and mathematics department at uh, uh, Technical University Munich, uh, which is one of the TU9. Uh, and I think of the TU9, it's probably uh, the most prestigious. Uh, so um, um, the speaker uh, has a, a very unique uh, background. Uh, he, has a, uh, he got his uh, BS and master's and PhD in mathematics and physics, uh, BS in uh, University of Heidelberg, and a PhD from uh, Meinem. Uh, then he uh, spent some time uh, in the United States, UCLA as a postdoc, and then uh, uh, Princeton Siemens uh, for another year. And um, he has uh, won many uh, research grants, prestigious grants, and uh, la I think this year he was nominated, oh, not nominated, he received a very prestigious award, probably the most prestigious award uh, awarded to German scientists, uh, um, the Leibniz uh, Award. Uh, they award eight to ten or eleven uh, scientists each year, and uh, our next speaker uh, won this award. And I should also say that he's uh, very, very young. Uh, of the three plenary speakers, I think he's the youngest one. So uh, <laughs> that's a noteworthy thing. Um, Please uh, help me welcome our next uh, plenary speaker, uh, Professor Daniel Kremis. Warm more applause. Thank you very much for this kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, many people, in particular Professor Yonki Pike, for organizing this great event and for reaching out to me to give me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our research today. The research area I'm working in is called computer vision. I'm sure you've heard of this area. When I started it almost two decades ago, it was a very small niche area, but it's, this is changing rapidly. So not only is the computer vision community growing at a very fast pace, but also when you open the, the newspapers, almost every day I see articles basically about the area that I work in be it self-driving cars, be it smartphone technologies, which all rely on computer vision. And more and more companies are entering this field and are supporting our efforts because there's a lot of uh, things to be done. One of the areas we've worked in for many years is, is the area of driver assistance. To give you one example, we started collaborating, in this case, with the company Daimler, uh, about 10 years ago, and you can see it's Daimler, they always put the camera in a way that their logo is in the picture here. So this is a common scenario, you drive down the street and uh, you can have obstacles that come into the driving corridor, and one of the things that you want is you want to understand the world in front of the car, and you want to predict what's going to happen. And this is a very challenging setting because it's a very difficult kind of real life scenario and to actually understand from images what, the, what, we, what is happening in the world is the major challenge in computer vision. What we developed are algorithms like the one you see here that can reconstruct the world in 3D in real time. Uh, 
and that can recover the motion of objects at the same time. Here red means moving, green means stationary, so we can extract some information about what's going on in front of the car, as you can see by these virtual fly-throughs. And you can see that there is an object, you can determine how fast it's moving, and that will tell you what's going to happen in the next few seconds. Here, for example, most of the scene is green, there is something red that's moving again, so we can predict there is something there that's going to be coming into our driving corridor in the next few seconds. Meaning we not only can recover the 3D world in front of the camera, but we can even make predictions about how this world evolves over time and about what's going to happen in the next seconds. And as you can imagine, this kind of information is vital because you want to know what's going to happen in order to save lives, to avoid accidents, etc. And this technology uh, is being implemented in the recent uh, editions of Daimler cars for driver assistance and also on the long run for self-driving cars. Here's another example, more from a consumer electronics domain. Uh, this is an implementation that my uh, student implemented a work of Lee and Morikis, which allows you to take just a smartphone, in this case I think it was an iPhone, uh, you can walk around our building, this is our computer science building, and you can see on the right side we can track the iPhone mm -hmm. at a very high precision in real time. So we can determine from the camera and the inertial sensory information from your smartphone, we can determine in real time where you are in the building. At a level of precision where you can walk around the building for say a kilometer and the error is going to be a roughly one meter after one kilometer of distance. So it's in the domain of, of uh, in the area of per mils in terms of tracking precision and so this can be very useful for you know smartphone applications if you want to kind of navigate someone not with Google Maps uh, in, in an area where you have GPS but in an indoor environment like the one we have here. I don't know about you, but for example, for me, it took me quite a while to find this room. If I had an app that could, you know, track me in the building and tell me where to go at any given moment, that would be quite helpful. More about consumer electronics. I mean, you are in working in this area, so I don't need to tell you what's there, what's coming. There's a lot of technology, head-mounted displays for virtual reality by various companies. Also, there are head-mounted displays for augmented and uh, what's called mixed reality. Um, and, and some of the visions that people have in these companies, and I've tried, for example, the HoloLens uh, just two weeks ago, it actually works fairly well. It can project objects into the real world, and you can walk around them, and you see them as if they're fixed in space. One of the key challenges to make this whole technology work is that you need to recover the 3D structure of the world in real time and you need to determine the location of your camera or your person or car in real time. And this is one of the challenging problems and I want to show you a little bit where we stand today and where we are going and what's coming. There are several parts about my talk. I will first talk about 3D reconstruction from images. This is a very classical problem that's been studied. We'll see that later for about 100 years now. The problem is something that you're all familiar with. You walk around the world, you see the world in, uh, through your eyes. It's a 3D world, but all you see is two-dimensional projections of that world. And the key challenge is to actually recover that 3D world that we see in these images. This is a very challenging and difficult problem, in particular if you want a fully dense reconstruction of the object surface. What we were able to show is that with the certain so-called convex optimization techniques, you can compute provably optimal reconstructions for this kind of problem. Which means that we can nowadays take images of an object, such as these, typically 20 or 30 photographs from different vantage points, and then we can have a system which in a fully unsupervised manner starts from a random initialization and carves out the optimal 3D object from this block. 
Beyond that, you see the reconstruction is fairly accurate, but there are some fine-scale details missing. What we can do now is we can actually recover the color of the object from these multiple photographs. Again, I don't want to go too, uh, too much into technicalities, but we can set up a cost function. And by minimizing this convex cost function, we can actually recover the texture on the object given the various images. So here you see the textured bunny, and uh, I have this bunny standing on my desk. It's been there for a number of years now. We've used it in many you know, research experiments, and I cannot distinguish that virtual bunny from the real one. Meaning with camera-based techniques, we're now at a stage where we can re recover the world around us at a degree of precision and faithfulness that can fool the human eye. And this is important because if you want to insert virtual objects into the world, you first have to acquire them somehow. And these techniques, actually here is an example, it's not only that it fools the eye, but it's actually much more precise than what our cameras acquire. This is one of the close-ups on one of the camera images, and you see this pixelization. The texture that we can compute is this one. So starting from a very uh, the low resolution noisy texture, we can get a very high resolution sharp texture. So we can get very precise texturing. And that's important because if you want to insert virtual objects in mixed and augmented reality settings, you want them to look you know, crisp, sharp, detailed. If you want just very high resolution 3D reconstruction, my recommendation is buy a laser scanner and scan your object. That typically gives you the best resolution. But there are many settings where we cannot use laser scanners and the community is moving away from laser scanners. In many areas like robotics that traditionally relied on laser scanners, people are moving towards cameras. And I'll show you why. First of all, cameras are much cheaper. Second, cameras are omnipresent. Every one of you has at least one, if not two, cameras on their smartphone. I'm sure your smartphone does not have a laser scanner. Thirdly, laser scanners are big and heavy, so if you have certain applications, like we do a lot of research on drones, quadrocopters, you cannot put big laser scanners on small quadrocopters. Well, you can put them, but the quadrocopter is not going to take off, so that kind of defeats the purpose. Whereas with camera techniques, we're now at a level of precision where we can reconstruct 3D objects at a very good level of detail where you see a lot of fine scale structures like the hammer, the sword, are nicely recovered just from images. And here's one thing that you could never do with a laser scanner. We can capture actions over time. We can film them with synchronized cameras and we can recover the action in 3D over time. At a level of precision, note that the entire rope of this rope jumping girl is recovered in the 3D reconstruction, just from cameras. There are other kinds of cameras that have been flooding the market, and one of the most successful consumer electronics in history is, as you know, the Kinect camera. It's typically used for gaming, but of course we as researchers, once we see technology, you know, we come up with lots of other ideas of what one can do with it. Let's say you have a camera that moves around, such a depth sensing camera, and you want to recover the 3D world. One of the challenges you have to determine is what is the motion of the camera, the rigid body motion, rotation and translation that moves the camera from one image to the next. We can again set up some cost function, minimize this cost function, we can track the camera and then it doesn't matter whether the camera moves or as in this setting, the camera is fixed but the object moves. And what we developed here is a real-time capable system to scan 3D objects in color. So what you see here is our student Julia, here's the image data, and once she moves around on that chair, we get, as you can see, in real time, the computer calculates a complete colored 3D model, which is immediately printable. 
So you can upload it to your favorite 3D printing service and you can get miniaturized versions of yourself, of your friends and family in no time, basically on the click of a button. So this is what I would call 3D photography and this is what's coming. So in other words, you know, if you think about the history of photography, about 100, 150 years ago they developed this technology and, and you can see how it influenced humanity now. Rather than creating 2D depictions of our world, we can create at the same ease and simplicity 3D models of the world around us. So we can virtualize pretty much any object you'd like. Put it in front of the scanner, rotate once, there you go. So we thought, hey, this is great. Let's create a company and commercialize this. Everyone told us there is a huge market. So we did. And you can now actually purchase uh, this software to scan yourself at home. Here are some examples of some of my team members and their 3D models after scanning and printing. I mentioned one of the challenges is not just to recover the 3D world, but also to determine the location of the camera or the car in driver assistance or the user with the head mounted display. And this needs to be done very accurately and what I also mentioned is this is actually technologies that started more than a hundred years ago. This, is, this came as a big surprise even to myself that people did computer vision well before computers ever appeared in, in our societies. This is one of the pioneers, a guy named Krupa, and in 1913, so more than a hundred years ago, he showed that if you see five corresponding points in two images, you can recover the motion from, of the camera from one image to the other and the location of these points in 3D. This was quite a breakthrough and it inspired a lot of computer vision researchers around the 80s and 90s to develop 3D reconstruction pipelines. Pipelines such as this one, which start with an, uh, a, the pair of images like Krupa uh, assumed, and they extract points in these images, put them in correspondence, so that they have corresponding point pairs in the images. And then the reconstruction builds up on these corresponding points based on Krupa's work. Krupa's work was quite pioneering, but it was also, I would argue, heavily misleading, because this is the dominant 3D reconstruction pipeline nowadays. The key point extractions, anyone working in this area will know there is techniques like SIFT and others to extract points. I would argue when I switch on my camera, I don't see corresponding points. What I see are colors. And I don't get two images, I typically get a whole stream of images coming from the camera in real time. So the question is how to deal with all these images and how to deal with the fact that we don't see point and corresponding points, but we see colors. And one of the uh, techniques that we've been pioneering in the last few years are so-called direct methods. These are methods that start from an image stream, but rather than doing this abstraction of point correspondence estimation, they directly recover 3D structure and camera motion from the image data. I don't want to go too much into detail, but what we showed is that these techniques are indeed more robust and more accurate than the traditional key point based approaches. Here is one of these systems, we called it LSD SLAM. It's the first direct method that is large scale capable and so LSD here stands for large scale direct slam. You see it's running in real time from a single handheld camera on a laptop CPU. So it's very fast, applicable to real time settings and as you can see we can recover fairly large environments just walking around with a single camera and a laptop. Here's another example in indoor reconstruction that we did after the presentation at the European Conference on Computer Vision uh, two years ago. And you can see we get a very faithful reconstruction of, of the world in terms of this point cloud. It's extremely robust, so there are people 
in the scene, people walking around, it still recovers the camera motion and the 3D structure fairly faithfully. You can use this for certain consumer electronics. This, for example, is a, is, a, is a toy. It's a drone that you can buy for a few hundred euros from the company Parrot. And we can use the onboard camera to localize the drone in real time. And here, real time is critical. If you cannot determine the pose of the drone in real time, it's going to crash into the wall. And then it might tell you what the pose was, but by then it's too late, right? So you really need real time for these systems. As you can see, we can fly around, we can recover the whole room that it uh, flies in at a very good level of detail and precision. And recently we've been able to show that you can use this so-called SLAM technologies to fly the drone autonomously. Here it is flying autonomously, there is no human involved. You can explore unknown environments, you can do obstacle avoidance, everything in real time on board. This is for the same technology, but in the context of self-driving cars here, the data is on the lower left. This is one of two cameras installed in a car driving through the town of Karlsruhe. And as you can see, we can recover the streets in real time on the laptop CPU. I think this is going to be the key core ingredient in self-driving cars. Because for a self-driving car, you need to know where is the car precisely and where is the world. You need to localize yourself in that world. And this does it all and you can see we can create complete 3D maps of the town in real time on the fly while we're driving around. In other words, we may not actually need map services. We can just put the cameras in the car. And if, if we have many cameras in many cars, we can almost instantly map the whole country. At, as you can see, a very good level of detail and precision, sufficient possibly to do obstacle avoidance, etc. The question is, how precise are these techniques? How much better are these direct techniques that we've been pioneering compared to the traditional key point based approaches? How much more accurate can we get in terms of camera localization? Here are some examples. This is recent work from this year. It's a technique called direct sparse odometry. Uh, work by uh, my student Jacob Engel in collaboration with Vladlin Koltun from Intel. And as you can see, my student walks through a subway station here. Very bad visibility, just one single camera. No inertial sensor, no additional sensors, one single gray value camera. And we can track it through the entire subway st station. We can come back out the other side, we can loop around, and you'll see there's going to be an error invariably. You accumulate a certain drift, a certain error, but what you see here is the arrow is what, you know, you see the bicycles, the same bicycle is there twice. This tells you how much the arrow is. It's roughly two meters arrow on a distance of hundreds of meters just from tracking a single camera. This is what I believe is the currently most accurate real-time SLAM or a camera tracker uh, available. Here's another evaluation. We actually recorded, you know, 50 sequences with hundreds and um, minutes of, of, of video data and tracked uh, the camera very accurately here. You see we walked down a flight of stairs. Visibility is very bad, lots of reflections, lacking textures, everything, nasty settings. But still you see the arrow is what? It's 10 centimeters on that distance. Is, that's a very tiny tracking arrow. And we get a model of the, of, the, of the environment in real time as well. In fact, here is a quantitative evaluation to the state of the art technique, which is a technique from Zaragoza, Spain, called Orb Slam, a very popular framework, and to our knowledge, the currently most accurate system. And here you see various curves. The blue curves is the orb slam, the yellow curve is our direct sparse odometry. The dashed curves are if you impose real-time performance. 
if you allow more computational time than real time, you get more accurate, but you can see that our method, even in real time settings, is much more accurate than the orb slam when it's not even real time settings. What you see here are different errors, and if you want to allow a certain error in the alignment or in the rotation or in the scale drift, uh, then we show how many runs we can do that have an error smaller than this error. Meaning here, for example, uh, whereas orb slam at a certain error has maybe 300 runs which are below that error, we have almost 500. So it's almost twice as, as robust and precise as orb slam. And why is that? The reason is that we work directly with the data. We don't do a point abstraction, uh, which is a heuristic step in between. We directly get the optimal results from the data. We don't lose anything in the data. And that's why we get more robustness and more precision. So to summarize, I talked about 3D reconstruction and showed you that we can recover the world in 3D even over time at a level of precision where even the rope of a rope jumping girl is recovered in the reconstruction. I showed you that in addition you can recover the colors of the world, not just the geometry but also the colors at a level of precision and detail that you can fool the human eye. I also showed you that we can use depth sensing cameras like the Kinect, Asus, PrimeSense. There are many companies, uh, also Intel, RealSense brought out new cameras that we are using extensively. And uh, we can recover 3D mo colored 3D models of the world in real time. So to speak, this is, you could call this 3D photography, whereas what you get here in the first part is something that you could call 3D television. You can watch actions from completely arbitrary viewpoint. You can, once you recover them, you can synthesize what would this action look like if I saw it from a very different angle of viewpoint. I told you about SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, meaning you want to recover the camera motion and the structure of the world. We can do this in real time on a laptop CPU and you can use it for many applications like driver assistance and self-driving cars or for other kinds of augmented and virtual or mixed reality applications. And in particular, I showed you that these are the currently most accurate real-time camera tracking systems uh, that have ever been proposed. Thank you for your attention.